Hello, this is David James, and uh, thank you for joining me on this uh, series. Um, it won't go a long, long time, but uh, it'll be uh, more than a couple ses sessions, I think. Um, and we're going to be talking about uh, which Bible is the best. Um, and before we get too carried away, um, some things you do have to know about them. Uh, it's why we're here. Um, the problem is, as, I, as you see right there, that every single translation of the Bible has one very serious problem. It is written in English. Um, English happens to be one of the weaker languages, um, even though it's um, the language of aviation, um, the language of the world in some respects. Um, it has a lot of inherent weaknesses to it. Um, and not um, anywhere near as comprehensive as um, um, is what the Bible was written in. The Bible was written in Hebrew, it was written in Aramaic, it was written in um, Koine Greek, and um, it's, it's important um, that we know um, what's behind the English print. Um, now, that being said, the most important um, thing going in and leaving this study is to understand that whatever Bible it is that you're comfortable with, that you read, um, assuming it's not, you know, uh, Jehovah's Witness Bible or some crazy nonsense like that, um, if it's a proper English Christian Bible, um, uh, if that's the one you read, and if that's the one you're comfortable with, then please read it. Um, this this video series isn't about condemning you over what you're reading or what you're not, or or you know this is for clarification. And um, some of this is my preference, um, obviously, because I have a, a strong bias in certain ways, and I make no secret of it, but. There's enough Bible um, uh, available that, um, you know, you can dilute the scriptures, you can warp them in certain ways, um, but the integrity of the scriptures runs from Genesis to Revelation. Um, you can take out verses, you can take out phrases, you can take out words, and, um, you know, the Bible wars that have gone on for generations have sought to do just that. So some of our modern translations have been severely compromised. Um, but keep in mind, most of the um, most of the compromise within the modern um, translations, like the New Living Translation, like the New International Version, um, even the Amplified, um, to some degree, um, they have problems. And that being said. Um, the oldest of the lot that we look at, the King James Version, it has problems, but its problems are a little more well-known because um, it's been around for more than 400 years. So let's just shed a light on, on what's what and what does it really mean and does it really matter? And, and the answer is yes. And um, that being said, let's find out what matters about it. So let's, uh, let's move on through and do a little bit of digging. So, which is the best Bible? If you want to rush to the end of the lesson, the answer is, it is the one that you will read and obey. It's more important that you read something that is a Bible, even though it may be watered down, even though it may be... Um, compromised in different respects. Now keep in mind when I say compromised, I'm talking about the original Greek text that some um, facets of um, the Christian world um, have sought and been successful at changing. And that's not really what we're concentrating on here. There's enough information out there on that that um, it can be studied, but um, it's important to understand that there is a difference, not just in the English text. There is there is a difference in um, the original text that they say is valid and 
scriptural and of God. So they say this one or that one is more reliable than the other because of this. So you'll see notes in your modern translations. You'll actually see missing verses. You'll actually read along and you'll say, oh, verse 14 is entirely missing. No explanation. It goes from verse 13 to verse 15. And there's nothing there. In some, some Bibles, they'll leave a note why a particular scripture is missing. They'll say, you know, it's not in the earlier manuscripts. Now, that's, that's an easy cop-out. And, you know, it's more political uh, than it is uh, reality. All right. So, here's where we'll start. So, a sign of unreasoned immaturity is to say something like, that isn't in the Bible. Of course, we need to be very mindful of something that is unscriptural as opposed to specific words and phrases that are not found in the Bible. The Bible has an answer for everything. Sometimes, like Deuteronomy 29.29, 29, the answer is it's none of your business. So, the rapture. Since I concentrate a lot on that, let's look at that word. For some strange reason, the word strikes controversy in many religious circles. They say, it isn't in the Bible. That word rapture is not in the Bible. Well, it's, not in the, it's not in the common English translations, but it comes from a Latin translation. The word is repimir, made popular centuries ago in the Latin Vulgate. And it is commonly transliterated in English as the word rapture. Though the word doesn't occur, the word explains something that is scriptural. Okay? So that being said, let's reason together for the sake of clarification. We all use many terms and phrases that describe something we understand that is truth as the scriptures present them. Here is a short list of other words that we commonly use all the time in our Christian conversation that are not found in any English Bible. Bible is not found in the Bible. Millennial reign. Now, thousand-year reign of Christ, thousand, you know, that's in there. Demon is not in the Bible, yet we mention that very casually all the time. Trinity is not in the Bible. Rapture, as I said, is not in the Bible. So we use those words quite commonly in normal Christian conversation because each one of them describes uh, something that is otherwise found in Scripture. Can you find a Scripture that says, you are to marry Alicia or Bob or Ralph? You can't even find those exact names in the Bible. So if your name is Alicia, Bob, or Ralph, does that mean you're unscriptural and God doesn't recognize you because your name isn't in the Bible? So obviously I, I'm speaking silly, but it, so there's places about, so you can't find those exact, name, exact names in the Bible, never mind whether you should marry them or not. But you can receive guidance from the scriptures in many and varied places that speak directly to what to look for in a spouse. And then, with that knowledge, walk in the wisdom of the Holy Spirit for your life to see if he witnesses to your spirit that that person is the one. So you see, the logic becomes very circular and um, it doesn't... Uh, really have much value when you start going down this road of, oh, that's not in the Bible. Like I said, plenty of things that are every day to our lives as believer are not in the Bible. But there's plenty about what you're looking for in the Bible. And just do a little reading, a little study, and you'll see that it's there. If you want to know if you're supposed to marry Bob you'll find a way through the scriptures will speak to your heart and witness to your spirit whether it's right or wrong. That's why you need to become familiar with the scriptures because the scriptures are a living word. They're not just a dead letter on, 
on white Bible paper. There are living words. The Bible, you don't just read a Bible. The difference between it and other books is you don't read a Bible just to read it. The Bible reads you. It's a living organism, so to speak. Most of the Old Testament was written in ancient Hebrew originally. Ancient Hebrew letters were descriptive by their symbolic appearance of everyday things. So mostly the ancient Hebrew, they've, um, it's, there is modern Hebrew, which has similarities. But back in the beginnings, the letters themselves um, would uh, form the appearance of what they meant. Each letter has a number assigned to it. The numbers, the spaces between letters and their intervals also have meaning. So believe it or not, God is into numerology and I'm, and I'm not qualified to teach on that. If you want to know more about numerology, you should listen to Troy Brewer. Now, modern Hebrew today has its roots in ancient Hebrew, obviously. Just like um, the way they spoke English in 1500, um, you'd have a hard time understanding them now in 2024. I say that to say that there is actual meaning behind the letters themselves. So unlike English, which is in comparison, a very surface level and superficial language. English, like so many languages, has more meaning and re relevance when spoken out loud verbally, as opposed to just written form. So it's about how you say something. You know, if you're married and you say something to your wife or husband in a particular way, it actually has more meaning than the words themselves. You can say, yes, dear, or you can say, yes, dear. You know, it speaks volumes. Need I say more? So... It's about the attitude and in intonation of the how something is said means as much or more than the words themselves. And um, Hebrew and Greek, um, in some respects, carries meaning um, within the words themselves in, to some degree. More so Hebrew and Aramaic are like that. Um, so it doesn't hurt to do some word studies and do some research as to what um, some of the root words actually mean. Keeping in mind that in, we realize to understand an English Bible, it is very helpful to get some basic understanding of its root languages. So in summary, the English New Testament as we know it was written in Greek. There are also ancient manuscripts available in Aramaic for both the Old and New Testaments, which was the common street language of the day. Jesus and his disciples would have conversed most commonly in Aramaic, but Greek was the language of the educated as well as the world of commerce and academia. So um, depending on your level of education, um, you would be more or less versed um, in, say, even uh, uh, Koine Greek. Uh, what they call classical Greek was a different form, which I am obviously not familiar with. I'm not even familiar with Koine Greek. I know some basic words, only because I've studied up on some words, but only as to what they mean in my Bible. Uh, no further than that. Um, find a Greek scholar that actually knows something, if you really care that much. There's enough study helps in, um, in, in the Bible itself, um, if you've got a good one, and online, that you can find out a lot about the roots of words. So don't be a lazy studier, just get into it and do some digging. When you read, I mean, there's times for reading and there's time for study. And, um, you know, the tri trick is not to spend too long chasing rabbits as you're, as you're supposed to be just reading. There's a time for, for, for the, the, the going through the scriptures. And then there's a time for parking and meditating on a word. So um, we know the difference. The Greek, civil, sil, the Greek civilization 
was unarguably, or maybe arguably, the most influential ancient culture in the history of the world. I would say so. By the 2nd and 3rd century BC, most of the civilized world was speaking, reading, and writing Greek. Most importantly, Greek was the language of commerce, everywhere along with Aramaic on the side. People like Paul would have known Hebrew, Latin, Greek, and Aramaic at the very least. We're going to stop it there. Um, join me on the next one, and uh, we'll keep going. Thanks for watching. Troubles I had have been washed away I'm cleaning up my act and moving on In the silence of my room I'll sleep all night and get up at noon There's nothing to distract me in my